afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers today that have come all the way from Summerlin, uh, British Columbia, to join our lecture series. Uh, first up is uh, Dr. Jerry Nielsen. Uh, Jerry is uh, one of our new Covey professional affiliates and also one of the research scientists at the Wine Brain Research Center at the Pacific Agri-Food Research Center, the Federal Research Center in uh, uh, Summerlin, British Columbia, in the Okanagan. Uh, he holds a Bachelor of Science and Master's in Environmental Science from Queen's University here in Kingston, uh, then went on to do a PhD in Soil Science from McGill University in Montreal. And over the last 30 years, he's been working uh, at PARC on soil fertility and plant nutrition issues for both tree fruits and more recently uh, uh, focusing in on uh, grapevine. Our second speaker, I'll do the introduction uh, for our second speaker uh, now too, is uh, Dan O'Gorman. Uh, Dan is also one of our, our new Covey professional affiliates, so we have uh, a group of uh, researchers from PARC that have joined us uh, at Covey. Uh, so he's also from the same facility, the Pacific Agri-Food Research Center. He obtained his Bachelor of Science from the University of Victoria uh, and his Master's from the University of Guelph. He started his career with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada at the Vancouver Research Station uh, at the UBC campus and then um, moved to Summerlin in the uh, early uh, mid-90s. He's working in the plant pathology group at PARC and he focuses on the development of molecular uh, diagnostics for fungal and bacterial pathogens, so tree fruit and also wine grapes. And we've had some collaborations with Dan uh, the last few years on, on our sour rot uh, uh, project in conjunction with Wendy and Kevin Smith. So currently the main projects uh, he's working on in the lab are grape and cherry powder and mildew with fungicide resistance and grape wine root and so with that, uh, we'll start off with Jerry, and then we'll turn it over to Dan uh, for the well, Thank you very much, Debbie, and it's been good to be back here. Actually, the Niagara region is legendary in our family. My uh, grandparents made a trip here from their farm in southeastern Ontario in the 1930s, and for all you young people, that was before the 401 was actually built. It was quite a trip. They came by Model T Ford, visited their friends, got a bunch of uh, peaches from the orchard, strapped them on the running board of the uh, Model T Ford and drove back to southeastern Ontario and declared that the peaches were excellent they were when they got back to Ontario. So talk about storage and transport. But uh, in those days, I guess Model Ts were Model Ts and peaches were peaches. So they don't last quite as long anymore. But what I wanted to talk about today was some of the research that we've been doing in British Columbia. I belong to the group that works on soil and environmental issues. And uh, specifically, we've got work going on now in the BC form of the DIAP. I believe you have that program here in uh, Ontario as well. So, where are we? And this is a photograph taken by the U.S. Army. I suspect they were looking for weapons of mass destruction, actually. Interestingly enough, they didn't find any other than the women's speed skiing team, but they were in Wyoming, mostly. Small Lake is the Okanagan Valley. The bigger area, of course, is the fruit production region in Washington State. This is taken about April, and you can see it's in between the mountains. And there's a lot of snow at that time of year, as there is now in the mountains. And that snow is quite important because we need it for the irrigation. And in fact, if you look at a map of the Okanagan Valley as here, and take a look at the precipitation that occurs during the summer months, which we'll call, for the sake of argument, April to October, although this year it's hard to tell when summer is going to start or, or finish, for that matter. You can see the millimeters, and this is millimeters of precipitation at a few sites, some of them and Picton and in the south of Suez, in terms of millimeters, so 25, 250 millimeters, about 10 inches of rain, so 6 inches of rain during the growing season. And below is a measure of the evaporation, or actually, strictly speaking, evapotranspiration. And you can see there's a huge gap there, 
particularly the Glossetta soil, is essential to have irrigation in our region for growing uh, crops, maybe not so, so, so uh, essential here in Ontario. As a result, a lot of the work we've been doing through the years has focused on irrigation, on conservative irrigation systems because there's only a certain limitation in the amount of water in those mountains. Of course, you can change the dams and the distribution system, but you've got to look at conservative irrigation systems. They were sprinkler, but they're mostly microjet, low pressure irrigation systems. We started getting into mulching, which is a conservation of moisture. We've got various ways of scheduling that irrigation in order to meet plant uh, demand for water or not, as the case may be. Of course, various ways of measuring the soil moisture, whether it's tensiometers as indicated there. Various ways of assessing the amount of uh, evaporative demand. And this is an atmometer which we've used to schedule a lot of our irrigation. And of course, playing around with ideas of less favorable or deficit or partial irrigation which is fairly popular in grapes, started really in Australia. The systems were grapes as one of the crops in the region. It was originally actually an apple growing region with the standard big old varieties, and I'm sure you have some of those in this region. Mostly all converted now to high density uh, plantings. You can see in the second picture. Irrigation systems were even, there was overhead and under tree sprinkler moved to the some mini sprinkler, I believe, there, but there's also, of course, the classic drip irrigation systems. Quite an interest in organic production in the region, as well as happens to be an organic apple orchard. There are some people who go organic wine growing, and there's some interesting problems that arise in such systems. Sweet cherry is a big crop that's expanding on the true fruit side because we have a good breeding program and these are all Summerlin cultivars which are growing and they also too are moving towards a high density system uh, with rootstocks like Gisela just coming into the area and being assessed. But of course what you want to know about is the uh, wine grape production region and this is what the landscape looks like uh, south of uh, Oliver and uh, now, as I said, it started as an apple growing area. There's a general trend out of apples into grapes. I think that's a worldwide trend, although they've hit the wall and or the ceiling. I guess it might be better classified in Australia, perhaps. But uh, certainly, I think the area of grapes in the Okanagan now equals uh, or maybe even exceeds the apple production area. And that's a far cry from the days when Andy, you were there. And, uh, primarily the rest of grapes. And as a consequence, if you plot out numbers like the number of wineries in BC uh, in the blue boxes versus the value of the industry, you'll see it's uh, got that rapid upward curve. I still think it, you know, it's smaller than the industry in Ontario, but uh, small but vital, as they say, uh, to, to the industry and, and the agriculture industry in British Columbia. Soils. Probably somewhat of a different range in, in British Columbia because of that dry natural vegetation tend to be, and, and because of its glaciated history, they were in mountain valleys, tend to be rather coarse textured soils, developed under low vegetation patterns, so the organic matter often very low, and then that has a lot of consequences to the soils low native fertility, low moisture holding capacity, low. Uh, uh, resistance to chemical change, whether it be cation exchange or buffer capacity, high susceptibility to leaching and acidification, particularly since developed under dry land conditions, 200 to 300 millimeters of precipitation per year, and then of course when you come in here, these have to be a, a portable under tree sprinkler system. You wet the soils up so they have a, a moisture climate more like the coast or Vancouver region. So, these create their own set of problems. And as a result, uh, with such poor soil, some of the things you want to do is to try and uh, fertigate, dissolve the fertilizer in the irrigation water. And we spent quite a bit of time working on that. And some of our new diac projects are looking at aspects from the point of view of uh, grapes. And some of the new plants we're putting in this spring. And of course, the 
important advantages to fertigation are that you have a lot of flexibility and timing because you, this is as part of an experimental setup. You can put in these all randomized, you can compare different treatments. Of course, the grower wouldn't do that and have one intake system, but uh, we are, we've done quite a bit of research on that for perennial crops. Because the potential is that you can match the demand for the nutrients. Of course, to do that, you have to understand the nutrient demand by the plant. But sometimes for perennials, that's not about well knowing. Uh, so the potential is there. And in fact, uh, there are probably a lot. Of, one of the big disadvantages of, of uh, putting the fertilizers and the water together, of course, is it tends to be restricted to your irrigation system. So if you have that system in there is going to do the same thing for every time in the, in the role. And of course, uh, micro um, precision uh, applications would be better if you do it by plant. I mean, the technology is getting close to that. And this is, I just want to show you this. I got from Patrick Brown at Davis, California. This is a controller, the engineering department working on there where you can time the uh, amount of water and therefore nutrient supply per tree. So, uh, with the computer technology, we're probably not too far off, or within a generation, with these type of micro precision uh, management, particularly for crops that are very valuable, like the high value agricultural crops. We do some interesting calculations by doing unit area of returns on perennials, compare them to wheat and canola, which of course are critical food crops. But of course, the, the uh, growers of those crops are. Uh, Pretty impressed when you get a per unit yield in terms of dollars from the perennial crop. Some of the issues that we deal with in soils, of course, with poor soils, one of the other ways people have talked about going is to, to go to organic conditions. And uh, this is, you can see some application being made, what's going to end up being the role. This is uh, bio. Uh, biological compost from Kelowna that we had one time testing in a vineyard. Uh, we've done a certain amount of work on that. The problem with the organics, of course, is that the availability is not as simple to understand as it is for chemical fertilizers, which tend to dissolve quickly. There's more of a microbiologically driven availability of the nitrogen, so it depends a lot on temperature and moisture. What we have done, it, it can work. It's not as predictable in some ways as the chemical fertilizer. The other thing we've done, and we've got trials going on in this new diap as well, is to try and look at mulches. Of course, one of the big disadvantages of mulches is application of In fact, if you want to challenge your coordination, try to apply a paper mulch in a windstorm and see how, uh, how good you are at doing it. But this is a system we worked out here on high density apples to spray on a mixture of waste paper and straw uh, works for a couple of years but weeds are very strong and weather cracks and moves everything uh, we're, we've got some uh, flax uh, mulch coming in to use in vineyards uh, it's uh, of course uh, something that they make linen out of so it's probably going to be very resistant to degradation at least that's what we're told by the jargon from the people but we've got that being shipped from Saskatchewan right now and we'll try and use that for moisture conservation. Of course, if these things are resistant to breakdown, maybe it's good for weeds, but then the availability of uh, nutrients, and of course the carbon and nitrogen ratio really affects that. So there's been a search for a lot of different organic materials. This is one that probably will, will, will not qualify for organic production. This is biosolids from the city of Kelowna which uh, some people are, it's actually quite a rich nutrient source in terms of, in terms of organic uh, nutrient content, one to two percent, which is very low compared to inorganic fertilizers, but compost here with bark uh, waste mulch, which we used to have a lot of uh, when the forest industry was doing well, but since 2008 we sell less to the United States and more to other people. But this is the system where they've got uh, for the city of Cologne, they've got the uh, tubes going underneath, they're pumping oxygen through, you turn that over and you produce a nice product, product. And in fact, if you do things like this, you can produce, this is a vegetation, poultry manure, straw mixture, which is much more acceptable for organic producers, uh, unless the, maybe not the chickens, uh, depending on 
one guy that we worked with, uh, Tillman Heinley, who was against death of all kinds, which I couldn't argue with, let me argue with that, but particularly of chickens, so he didn't want to eat chickens. His, his compost, aeration turn, I could get it up about 65 degrees centigrade for a certain length of time in order to knock out the weeds and disease which would not otherwise come in there. Okay, well here's what some of the, the plantings look like. This is one that we worked in before. This happens to be Merlot, uh, and that's the type of spacing. Planted in 1999, that picture is probably taken about 10 years old, I would expect. This is, uh, gives you some idea of the uh, climate. Harvest in the three years we were working on, October 6th, 2nd, and 26th. Now we have had a trend towards earlier harvests, and I'm going to come back to that point about climate change, but that gives you an idea for Merlot. Now, the last couple of years, we're on another cycle in the Pacific uh, Northwest, the cold cycle, and so our harvests have been delayed in, in 9, 9, 10, 11. But that was a trend that we seem to get earlier in the 90s and early zeros. Here is Cabernet Sauvignon. This is what it looks like about uh, early November. This particular picture was taken again as planting spacing. But there again gives you an idea of our growing season. Harvest the 27th, 24th, 22nd. Well, those three years we're working. Last couple of years, very hard pressed to get good quality from the Cabernet. So in our, our area, because of the shorter season, is looking peculiar again this year at the beginning, uh, but uh, we'll see what happens. Okay, for nitrogen, I'm going to specifically talk a little bit about nitrogen fertilization. Uh, you saw how sandy some of those soils, all about two thirds of those soils are. And this is the, the nitrogen cycle various ways of looking at this, but basically if you have organic matter, but if we only have 2%, you might not have a lot there, converts to ammonia, and then the kinetics of that drives it right through the nitrate, really, and nitrate is quite mobile. So quite important about the water passing through the soil and the texture of the soil. I would imagine that you don't have exactly the same situation here. I saw some fairly heavy soils through here. The precipitation patterns are going to be different, but the principles are going to be the same. What's going to drive the availability of the nitrate in the soil is the precipitation available. Now, the units aren't on here, but this is a total applied in millimeters. Those are 50 millimeters, which is about 2 inches, 50, 100, 150, 250, 300 millimeters. And that's for one of the vineyards we worked in, is the amount of water to express it in depth at different Physiological stage, uh, phenological stages of the plant, between bud rate to bloom, bloom to raise on, and so on down there. And those numbers give the amount that was actually the solid bottom ones were what was applied in the vineyard, and the top hatched ones were the precipitation that occurred in those particular years uh, in those particular vineyards. It does give you a good snapshot. You can see that. In most of the active growing season, what's dominating the, the soil is a precipitation you're adding, you're driving an awful lot of water on there. So depending on how you shift on irrigation, is going to leave or not leave the mobile nitrate forms in the soil. Now you could probably do the same thing for this region, of course it's going to be quite different, but you could certainly plot up your uh, patterns to see what they are. I don't know how widespread irrigation is, but if it is irrigation, you're going to have a different, different situation. Uh, that's one side. That's if you add in the nitrate. Of course, the other thing is the supply. As I said, if you don't have a lot of organic matter, you're not going to have a lot of supply for you to plot the same thing in terms of amounts of fertilizer. But if you are have organic matter, higher organic matter, which I expect you to have here, then you have nitrogen probably coming in being mineralized as part of the precipitate the moisture temperature cycle near the soils. And the great thing about organic matter, of course, is it's all biologically tied in because the microorganisms are tend to be active in the plants are so the mineralization and availability is more time that the plant needs it. But uh, and there are other things to critique as well. 
Okay, timing of nitrogen, and this is just a little sketch here to talk about the time. In our region, probably most of the fertilizer is put on in the dormant period for nitrogen, and it is the most common fertilizer to apply. Uh, and the rates now tend to be about 40 to 50 pounds of actual N per hectare, because we probably tend to run quite low, that has effects on the vigor, and effects on perceived effects on the quality of the grain. Uh, now, whether you can move later in the year to bloom, which middle of June by and large, or raisin, I put raisin up here because we're doing some work on that now for the diet. Some people even speculate post harvest, but of course, uh, you've got the thing worry, worry about winter hardiness. It's always been said that if you have a high nitrogen vine, it is more susceptible to winter hardiness. I must confess that we've done a lot of that bud hardiness is done here and it's been difficult to prove it. A lot of very building in buds and uh, one or two degrees, hard to show. But uh, certainly if when you get winter dye back, you get it from the tips back or the nitrogen is also higher. So uh, that's the uh, general belief. So, uh, and of course balance, with the soil we've got, balance of the nitrogen is quite important. Uh, I mentioned winter hardiness, but of course, if you run at a low nitrogen to keep the vigor down, to keep the shading down, you also tend to have a problem trying to accumulate nitrogen within the berries themselves. Something called yeast assembled nitrogen concentration, or yang, if that's up there or not, nitrogen for yeast fermentation. And so, because we tend to run low for other perceived quality reasons, we also tend to have rather low yank numbers, and uh, that has, of course, been subject to research. Just wanted to show you this kind of complicated diagram here, but basically, we had trials on Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon with two nitrogen rates at two different times. The early one is what we call late dormant, April May fertilization before. Buds have broken out, and again this year they haven't broken out, they're pretty dormant. And late, and this is called bloom, say about the middle of June. And we're just changing these uh, timings to see if we can influence the yank. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, what you have to then do is get a nice competent sample of from the cluster. There's going to be a bit of variation in the cluster as well. And look at various parameters. And what I'm talking about, we're going to show you some data for it. He's a single nitrogen concentration uh, called Yank by that titration. That's the method that was used. It's a fairly standard one. And uh, here are some numbers from those trials. Again, very complicated uh, graph, but I just want you to draw your attention to a couple things here. It would be nice to be over 140 milligrams per liter concentration in those uh, um, must in order to get good fermentation, so that line is dotted in there. And if you look closely at that, you'll see that not th these are the blue dormant low nitrogen is, is the standard practice in the in the vineyard. But 40 in this particular vineyard, 40 pounds per acre, we're talking about the same thing. You can see how low sometimes that yank is. And trying to get it up by rate first thing, and that helps a little bit, late bloom at a higher rate, seem to look promising, putting on a little later, maybe get into the berries, so uh, well, maybe we should sh shift the timing a bit, providing we don't cause the other problem, which is too much bigger, and uh, of course, measures a bit bigger, you can estimate it for at raise on by a percent style, of course, the obvious, simply look through those rows, you've got lots of bigger, you're going to have closed in very low numbers. So that's, you don't, you want to put it into the nitrogen preferential, into the berry preferentially, but not into the, the shoots. And so I'm going to show you here the raw off the presses. We've got about seven different sites where we're looking at, where we ask, ask for uh, a control, which are the white ones as being very low yang, I've put up Cabernet Sauvignon so, uh, so or low 
And so they came through for us. You can see that's around 70, and wow, this one's even lower, just the control, right? Which is just the natural level of what they're doing, 40. Uh, and uh, what we're doing is only trying things at Verizon, or around Verizon, actually, for our area around the end of July, around Verizon, around August, early August, middle August, end of August. Some foliar sprays at one percent, two percent, and I show you two sites. They're all seven of them the same. This is a foliar urea spray, so it's brought up the most. Very consistent across all seven sites, and the, the uh, lower concentration not quite as successful. So there's obviously a concentration right here. We compare that to nitrogen only. The same amount of nitrogen applied through. Through the, to the ground only. Now, you have to think about what we're doing here. We're putting it on, in our case, underneath the emitters, these are all drip emitter, uh, drip irrigated here. At the same time, we do the foliar sprays in July and August, with the small amounts you get in the foliar. But boy, it looks pretty discouraging, at least on the samples taken at the harvest, which is in October, after putting them on in August. We really see that it have much effect there. Now, there's all kinds of stories about where the sinks are in different plants, and uh, the berries become a very strong sink from after set and, and production afterwards. So you would think, in theory, that you could maybe direct it in there and go there and not the shoots. Certainly didn't go to the shoots. We measured the vigor, no, no difference, no difference in color yet. So of the, of the leaves. Preliminary work this year. We're doing the same thing, but we're putting 15 n on the tracer. We sent these samples this year uh, to our collaborators at Scotland to do the uh, amino acid analysis because Yang is a very gross measure of titration of water and things in there. And uh, we don't have all that data back yet. What I did see, of course, was an amazing difference between amino acid profile by color bar, which I guess is not very surprising, but we're wondering what the difference is going to be if you assimilate the nitrogen through the leaves versus through the ground, uh, if, if that's going to make a difference uh, on the thing. So that's uh, uh, really something we're working on right now to try and increase yank without having adverse other effects. Now, what's going to happen to these guys in the second year? I assume that the nitrogen went into the roots. Maybe it didn't make it all the way to the fruit. Who knows? But of course, with N15, we're going to have to take apart some samples of this thing and find out where it is actually going. But there is a lot of information in South Africa about partitioning your nutrients at different times. So that's, that's one uh, trial that's going on. I want to mention potassium. Uh, this is penny old potassium bloom kind. This is a uh, records that I got from Tim Watson at, who's at South Valley Sales, and this is a number of ignorant samples. He had thousands of samples, right? And what this is is a plot of how many uh, were less than 0.5% on up here. And the thing you see about potassium in our region, and I call this the John Gilboy effect on potassium, is pedial potassium. Some up here, around 5 to 7 percent, which is pretty high. We also have these down in here, which are pretty low. And of course, the big thing about potassium is what effect does it have on the pH of the juice. And I'm going to return to pH because I don't think it's going to be so simple as to only be potassium. But, uh, and uh, that's probably a normal distribution. Tails of both ends with a lot of stuff following the middle. But we're working now with some orchards, or some vineyards in here and in here. At this direction, of course, we can add things. It looks like they're probably close to efficiency and measure the response of titratable city pH and so on up here. Because they're all high, we had a problem with our pH and our juices last year. Of course, there's something about weather we're going to talk about a little bit too, but uh, you can leave stuff off here and look at it going in the opposite direction. That's, that's a project that's going on in the area right now. And the other nutrients we struggle with, uh, as 
I said, the organic matter concentration is very low. One of the nutrients that's tied up a lot in organic matter is boron. And it's also in precipitation uh, because there's boron borates from the sea. And uh, so if you're in an area that has low rainfall, you don't get much boron. So we've had boron deficiency. And if you look at these numbers, these numbers in here are probably deficiencies. Now, people are doing applications. You don't need a heck of a lot of boron because it's very narrow with these micronutrients so deficiency. What we're looking at here, is, but boron is something that is often applied, particularly the soil boron levels are, are low, so boron is not a bad measure in our regions, and is to look at uh, some multi-nutrient applications to organic materials that have everything. So we're comparing that to just nitrogen only. But of course, it might be easy just to go to a simple nitrogen fertilizer. And the other nutrient uh, uh, is, that we get a lot of too is uh, deficiency, is zinc problems. And there are treatments for these. And of course, if you pull your spray up on the tissue, you're going to get hundreds of parts per million in there, which you can see a lot of people aren't doing that. I don't know how necessary those things are. But again, there are, are things in the organic matter, so we're looking at that as a side issue. Now, one other big, big problem we think we have is a global warming uh, uh, issue. And this, you've probably seen this graph before in some form or another, often called a hockey stick kind of thing. Only I don't know whether this is really a hockey stick. It doesn't look like to me. But uh, and then uh, this is from the IPC third assessment. There's probably the fifth assessment now. Too bad the slides are already made. But, Indication of the variability of weather is in there. See those standard errors? Here's the 1930s, 40s. My grandparents had their Montmorency sweet cherry, or sour cherry tree in southern Ontario. And it came all through the 40s. Had lots of problems in the 50s, and by the time we sold the farm, it was done. Here's where we are now, of course, which way we're going these curves. But this is potentially a problem, or maybe it's a, it's a bonus. Maybe Canada is going to become the new California. However, there are lots of things we don't know about temperature as well. And this is something that uh, Harvey Kwame and Joe, Harvey Kwame and Joe Kepler published actually in the Journal of Plant Science. This is taking the historical production records for grapes in British Columbia from 1930, yes, there were grapes in 1930, to 1989. Now, that's not uh, very typical today because that was about the more rust era. era. Say anything about there. So, and this is totally yield, which is, of course, as we all know, yields not quality and so on. But they ran through uh, some clever statistical methods of correlation analysis that Joe Caprio had developed at Montana State and tried to find associations with problems with yield, just only yield. Greater right than 32 degrees centigrade in the harvest year, decreased yield. These are just correlations, right? Over a 59 year period. Greater than 26 degrees centigrade in the July pre harvest year. Amazing things have come up, maybe accident, who knows. Uh, and that was rather than 32, a little cooler in that July, early July period. Greater than 28 degrees centigrade in August, the harvest year, and your maximum temperatures, problems. And of course, the big one that always comes out in Canada, winter hardiness, and of course, tremendous range because it depends on how dormant those plants are. These temperatures here early on can be early in October, November can be a big problem. And not, you know, when you get down to minus 20 in the middle of January, I know there's lots of work going on here in Ontario, it's going to be the interest there. Interesting, I didn't put it up here, but if you had minus 9 in November and December, it's actually a positive thing to yield, probably because the plants were hardened off uh, more properly. Okay, this is just a uh, Statistical aberration, you might say, is statistical correlations. And the question is, what about the vinifera's now? And uh, so we've started looking at that in a bit more detail. Given, and the, the perennial is going to be very difficult, and I just want to mention this just to keep an idea. For any perennial, it uh, doesn't really matter. You've got a multi year cycle of formation of these buds, sometimes a year before. So you can have carryover effects. It's very complicated. 
And you can see this is just for maybe it's for Apple, or we were working on Apple at the time. But you can see the complex cycles in a perennial plant. You've got brood growth and so on. And the similar things about how the carbon is assimilated in the nitrogen and the remobilizing curve. So these are very complicated. Different for grapes, we prune a lot more of this stuff on. So, well, you know, you're probably going to be affected all these things are. So we just started to look at this as part of the diet. And here, I fought fresh off the presses again here. This is Merlot in 2010. Now last year was an odd year. It was probably a cooler year on average. But this is various parameters against juice pH. And did work nicely. Never do it twice. 2011, we'll be able to see if that happens. I'd be surprised if it did. For whatever the reason was, these are vineyards located from the south of Okanagan to the north uh, area. This is growing season mean temperature, which is just take every day, the mean temperature every day, and average it out. We call the growing season equal to October 1st, arbitrary. Right? There's a difference you get within the regional area, 15.5 versus 17.2, 1.7 every day. There is the plot of last year's juice pHs. Always said when you're in California and it's very hot, the pH, the grape juice goes up. Certainly looks like that's a, a dominant effect. Now there are other things here. There's sugars, there's other things going on. There's the way the phenology is changing. There's a lot of stuff going on here. But I just showed this, this as sort of a uh, illustration of some of the things we're having to start to look at now. In general, the feeling is it's going to be better. It's going to be a good news story. Some people have hypothesized that the vinifera error in Canada was because of the last 20 years. Now, are we in a 20-year cooling cycle? Who knows, right? But uh, if you're George Bush, it never happened, right? Uh, July temperature. Interesting enough, take a look at a lot of these parameters. We're trying different measures here. This is the average uh, temperature in July. Just take July. This is the growing degree day accumulated above 10 degrees from uh, up, uh, uh, to uh, up to harvest, from dormancy to breaking dormancy to harvest. This is for raisin to harvest. Didn't seem to be any difference here with the thing. But they all seem to be correlated in this particular year. So, well, what can you do about that? Good question. <laughs> what can you do about that? Uh, I suppose at the higher level, uh, if this gets higher and higher, there may be something about cultivars. But right now, I think in Canada, we're in a situation where we can adopt all these uh, classic uh, cultivars, looking good so far, touch wood. So uh, anyway, something else that we're doing through the... And so I just like to... This is a bit of an overview of some of the issues going on. So. I'd uh, like to thank you for your attention, and uh, uh, if you have any questions. I think we'll... Okay, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to talk today about grapevine trunk diseases, uh, and my talk is going to focus mainly on a disease survey that we started uh, a few years back in, in response to some concerns of new symptoms uh, of vines at the the near managers were seeing. So it's going to be a, a kind of an overview of, of what we found, and uh, we're going to have a few snapshots of the pathogens and diseases that we've identified so far in, uh, in the open market. So uh, root diseases, <coughs> root and trunk diseases of grapevine uh, cause vine decline all around the world wherever grapes are grown. Um, these are some of the diseases that cause this are Esca, Botchesferia, Kendra, Blackfoot, Utaipa, uh, Phenopsis, and others. Uh, they're all progressive and destructive uh, diseases. And uh, in the Okanagan, as I said, we've only recently been seeing them uh, start to emerge. And this was back in 2007 when I first got some calls from some vineyard managers to come down and look at their, their crop. Back in 2007, at the same time, we had uh, Doug Googler from UC Davis come up to Park and give us a presentation on this subject. And he used this map in his presentation just to show the distribution of trunk diseases and known trunk diseases worldwide. And as you can see in Canada, uh, 
there's either no grapes being grown there or we have no trunk disease. And in, uh, in BC, there was, it's a partial truth, I guess, because uh, we only just started realizing that uh, perhaps we have a problem. <coughs> And Jerry did a pretty nice introduction of where we are, but uh, I'll just run through it again so I don't mess up my timing or anything. Um, we're here in the Okanagan, about five or six hours east of Vancouver. Uh, grapes are growing up and down the valley, north to south, and we're nestled right down along the uh, U.S.-Canada border. Grapes are also growing a, a little further east towards the Purcell and the Rocky Mountain. Rocky Mountains, kind of in this region here, but they're also grown um, down just outside of Vancouver in the Fraser Valley, uh, as well as on Vancouver Island and on some of the Gulf Islands in between the mainland and Vancouver Island. So, um, as I said, we had some calls come in back in 2007. They wanted us to come down and look at the vineyards, look at some of these new uh, and unusual symptoms they were seeing. And uh, basically, uh, some of the symptoms were, that we were seeing were just described as general decline uh, symptoms, rapid and or slow decline uh, of the plant health, delayed growth, general loss of vigor, uh, yellowing leaves, small leaves being produced, tendril dieback, trunk dieback, and dead arm. Uh, we didn't have a lot of luck initially isolating any of the pathogens that we thought would be responsible for these, but uh, reading the literature, this is what we were kind of expecting to see. Uh, perhaps ESC also known as young vine decline, uh, black goo or Petrie's disease, uh, or perhaps Eutypha uh, may be responsible for, for uh, these diseases, uh, the symptoms we were seeing anyway. So the calls kept coming in, we kept going out to check out uh, what was going on, and some of the vineyards were being hit really hard. Uh, where, where a large percentage of their, especially young plantings, were, were failing. And in other places, it was more sporadic and fine here and there. And in the early season, uh, this is pretty typical of what we're seeing. Pretty easy to spot. I mean, as you can see, the healthy vines in the background, uh, as compared to this little guy up front that's uh, you know, delayed and stunted growth. If you came back later in the season, often these vines would catch up and, and you wouldn't be able to spot them unless it was flagged and you'd say, oh, maybe it's recovered. Go back the next year though and nine times out of ten it wouldn't have made it through the winter. So, um, again, just another uh, image of uh, an older vine this time, just uh, way behind uh, the vines that you can see in the background, just stunted growth. Lots of small yellow chlorotic leaves uh, being produced on vines. More yellow leaves. Uh, uh, you can see patches up here. Uh, oh, there's a big patch of yellow leaves here as well. Uh, this vine here is struggling. As well as um, vines, older vines that would just simply, they, they would just die, so would, which would trunk die back, or just one arm would die uh, as in dead arm. One of the most um, probably dramatic things we, we found in that, uh, the initial survey were this sudden collapse of vines. And uh, this would occur over a two-week period where you have a healthy vine two weeks prior and then you know, after seven, ten days, fourteen days, completely dead. All the leaves are just crispy and, and gone. And uh, you can see uh, the grapes clusters down here. So, Two weeks before, this, this vine was healthy looking. There was no indication that it was struggling at all. And then two weeks later, bang, it's, it's gone. And this, the, the symptoms of the sudden collapse are often uh, associated with pest. Uh, but uh, initially, we didn't, we didn't find this. What we did isolate out of these, out of these vines were cylinder carbon destructants, which is a pathogen known to cause black foot disease in grapes. Um, however, later visits to the same block, we uh, also identified the ESCA pathogens. Uh, so what was going on is a, a potential multiple infection uh, in, in the vines. And that's something I'm going to talk about a little bit later when I, I touch on uh, multiple infections of, of these vines. But the, uh, the symptoms that we did associate with cylinder carbon and black that were these black sunken lesions in the roots, the vascular tissue below the graft unions were often completely blackened. Uh, 
uh, the leaves would be stressed or scorched looking. Uh, we also saw stunted growth and, and delayed growth and, uh, and by death plugs. Uh, we also found an ESCA on our surveys and uh, this disease is caused by Faye Moniella plumbidiscora as well as Faye acrimonium species. Uh, the field symptoms are delayed growth, delayed and stunted growth, progressive loss of vigor over a several year period. Uh, again, you're going to see yellowing leaves, small, small stunted leaves, uh, as well as shock tip and tendril dieback. If you cut into these vines, uh, that's kind of the telltale symptom that you, once you know what you're dealing with, it, there's a speckling of the vascular tissue and often uh, it can be quite gooey and that, that's where the name black goo came from, but I, I think there's a bit of a pushback to that name of the disease, black goo, so I think most people are just calling it ESCO these days. Um, how the infection starts, uh, for ESCO as well as most of the other diseases I'm talking about, they're wound pathogens, and uh, during wet, warm wet weather, uh, you have spores released from previously infected wood or dead wood in the orchard. And uh, these spores, uh, once released by the wet weather, will land on fresh pruning ones, they'll colonize these, uh, these areas and colonize the vascular tissue <coughs> and causing uh, the vascular disruption. Um, see here, uh, the, the black speckling of the vascular tissue. So this is causing not only vascular stress on the plants, but also there's toxins that are produced that are going to impact on plant health. Just another close-up, and I, I just wanted to point out that on this slide you can see one of them is, is very quite dark black, the vascular uh, discoloration. On the other one is, is almost brown in color, and uh, uh, this is thought to be uh, uh, caused by the different pathogens that cause the disease. So one pathogen uh, would be uh, causing the black gooeyness and as, uh, other ones would be causing the brown. But I'm not good enough to tell this part. I haven't seen enough of it yet to, to be able to make the, those calls. Uh, again, this is uh, what uh, some of the ESCO pathogens look like in culture when isolated just from the margin of the disease vascular tissue. We also, in the survey, found eutypic dieback. Uh, it's caused by the pathogen, another fungal pathogen, eutypic lava. And uh, if the cankers that are produced in this disease aren't readily available, they may be covered up by, by bark. In the spring, the springtime is the easiest time to see this, and you're going to see symptoms, uh, as you can see here, these small uh, leaves and small shoots that are produced. Um, so there's stunted growth early in the spring, which is very visible. The other symptoms that are probably more characteristic are the dead arm, trunk dieback, cankers uh, that are produced from this pathogen. And often this disease is found in more established vineyards. Uh, that might be 10 years plus in age. The, uh, the cankers that are produced, here are some typical pictures that, that are produced by a type of dieback. Uh, the typical V-shaped canker and uh, also a less typical almost U-shaped canker. So uh, you can have both being formed by this uh, pathogen. And for the, any lab rats in the, in the crowd, we also have a picture of the, the culture again and two different spore types that are produced by the pathogen, both aspospores and canidia. Again, uh, it's a wound pathogen, so under wet conditions, spores are released, uh, they penetrate, colonize and penetrate the uh, pruning ones, and once established in the, in the woody tissue, they start to develop uh, the cankers that move down the trunk. And on the other side, it's just a, again, uh, just some variation on the cankers that have been found uh, from this pathogen. Now, canker production, in the, if you go to the literature, both Eutypa dieback and Wachisteria canker, which is another related uh, disease, are, are said to form these V tape or wedge shaped cankers. And, and sometimes they do, but quite often we're seeing quite irregular shapes. Uh, v 
V-shaped, U-shaped, uh, on, on an internal canker formation, as well as uh, cankers down here, which maybe almost look like a watermark or a water stain. So it's, it's quite irregular. Uh, we're seeing all sorts of different things that uh, wouldn't suggest, if you only read from the literature, that, uh, that this is U-type or Bacchusaria canker. So they are quite varied. And Bacchusaria canker, as I just mentioned, another disease similar to Utypa, and often confused with Utypa dieback as far as the symptomology. Uh, this pathogen, pathogen uh, this disease is caused by Bacchusaria uh, species. And uh, the symptoms that are seen in the early spring are bud necrosis, uh, delayed and stunted growth, as you can see in the picture. Uh, short picture nodes is also a symptom. And uh, in the canes, the, we have cane dieback, uh, trunk dieback, cankers, and dead arm, again, very similar to a lot of the symptoms you're seeing for the type of. And because they're wound pathogens, at one site we went to, I was, the sample I took, I was cutting sections through the trunk, and at every place there was a, either a scar from suckering or a pruning wound, there was a small canker starting, starting to develop. And, um, all the way up from the top to the bottom. So as these develop slowly, the vascular system is, is being choked out and the, the vine will eventually fail. Back in 2007, uh, after a year of looking at uh, what we had in the Okanagan, um, Bacchusferia canker uh, was probably uh, next to Blackfoot, the most common disease that we were identifying. So we decided that out of those two, we were going to look at bot canker just a little bit closer. Now, the, the results to date are a little bit different than this, but back in 2007, these were the two main diseases that we were looking at. And to, uh, we decided to put up uh, spore traps in, in vineyards that uh, we had already isolated the disease from uh, to do a couple things. We wanted to look at the biology and epidemiology of this pathogen and disease to see when the spore, what dates the spores were being released, under what weather conditions they were being released, and uh, what kind of spore loads or disease pressure uh, we had in the vineyards. And the reason this is important, again, it goes back to the fact that it's a wound pathogen and its main route of entry is through pruning wounds. So if we can uh, identify when the high uh, spore loads are in the vineyard, we can make recommendations to the growers when to prune or when not to prune. And this is what, one of the things we're hoping to uh, figure out from this. Uh, to handle all the spore trap data, we designed uh, some molecular tests to not only detect the botrosphere spores, but to be able to quantify them. And, oops. And so once we had uh, the spores quantified, uh, we overlaid it on some weather data. And uh, the top graph will show in the blue bars is the spore trap uh, or the spore concentrations. The, the stars, the red stars, are going to be your mean temperatures. Uh, the bottom graph shows precipitation in millimeters. So there's a, a couple things I, I want to point out. And if we look at both the March data here as well as down here, so 2008 and 2009. In both cases, it, they've peaked after a, a long, cold winter. You just get a little bit of rain, a little bit of precipitation coming down. It's not much, it looks maybe about five, two to five millimeters of rain, which uh, looks like all is all that's needed. But uh, what has happened is that after a cold winter, the temperatures here just pop up above five degrees on both, both months. So it looks like a little bit of rain, temperatures that are warming up about five degrees, and then you get a sudden burst of, of ascos, uh, spores that are being released, and uh, quite significant. Uh, the other place I want to look, want to point out is just this area right here through the winter, November through February, where there was absolutely no detectable spores uh, being being found in the vineyard, and although we had. In November, significant rainfall. Uh, it might not be significant compared to the rain you guys are having here over the last month, um, but it's up over 20 millimeters of rain for that month. And still, there's no detectable spores being released. Uh, the temperature, the temperature here, 
has just dropped below that five degree point. So it looks like temperature plays a big role even with the precipitation uh, below five degrees. We're not getting any spore release. So uh, recommendations to the growers may be, you know, pruning the winter, which most of them do, but uh, you know, it, it gets cold out there, uh, and quite often they'll delay that into March. You know, when things start warming up a little bit more. The recommendations for management of bot, bot canker is um, comes from warmer climates. A lot, a lot of recommendations coming out of California or uh, or Australia. And uh, one thing we need to know before I look at this any more is that there are no chemical controls for managing this in the registry in Canada. Uh, although the lime sulfur, dormant lime sulfur applications, is said to be beneficial, uh, eliminating the burn and burning the debris, the pruning debris, as well as protecting the, uh, especially large pruning wounds with a 5% uh, boric acid and latex paint is also said to be beneficial. Uh, double pruning and late pruning uh, is interesting, and, and this has been shown to work quite well in places like California. And if we just pull up the California weather data here, we can see that their, their wet season uh, which is indicated by the, the purple bars, is um, probably November through February and, and into March. And so their temperatures are warm, they have lots of precipitation, and they're going to have lots of spore release during this time. So they want to uh, avoid pruning during those wet periods. So to delay the pruning into the end of March and early April, if possible, would be a good recommendation. Or the late, uh, the double pruning, where they go through in the winter and they prune everything down to maybe 20, 25 centimeters, uh, and then come back through April really quickly and finish it all off. What, hap what that does is, if there is any uh, infection in the, the pr pr pruning site uh, from the winter pruning, it hasn't moved all the way down to uh, where they can, uh, all the way down into the mine, they can snip it off later in April so that they're effectively uh, eliminating the infection. If we then bring the Okanagan weather data back in, we see that our rainy period is almost completely opposite from what we're seeing in California. Basically, it's, it's May and June, but we have sporadic rain falls through the summer into the, into the fall. So our weather conditions, our, our dry period is going to be in the winter months. Uh, it's dry and cold. We're not having any spores produced there. Um, let's see. The, the Wet periods, April in 2008 wasn't that wet, but we can have a fair bit of rain April, May, June. So, uh, but the temperatures are warming up and it doesn't take a lot of rain, I think. And as we're seeing that we have these high spore releases in March, this is obviously a time that uh, if we continue doing this data, uh, this research, we're going to see if this is a constant thing over year to year that we have these high spore releases in March and it would definitely be a time to avoid pruning. Um, we, um, so the double pruning and late pruning may take a, may be beneficial uh, if you have a small acreage and you can do all your pruning in April. Uh, you're going to avoid that large spore release in March. Uh, also, double pruning may also work if you have enough time to come in, uh, go through your vineyard in the early or in through the winter, and then come back later in late March or April to finish it off. Uh, that also may, may be a recommendation that would be worth looking at. Um, so, anyways, it's, uh, as I was saying. Uh, the recommendations of late pruning or double pruning may work in the Okanagan. It's something we need to look at a little bit more, get a little bit more spore trap data um, to, to see what the patterns are year for year for year. But uh, it's just one thing uh, to keep in mind that not all recommendations can be adopted, you know, part blank, uh, depending on, on where you're from, because uh, each region is going to be slightly different. So switching gears a little bit, uh, multiple infections, it's just, this was more observations that were made uh, during the early part of the disease survey, and uh, quite often in young vineyards we were seeing this, but uh, we have also seen it in older, more mature ones, that where we're seeing multiple symptoms on the vines. 
Oops. And uh, as you can see here, above and below the, the graphs, the graph union, uh, we have very black uh, darkening of the vascular, vascular tissue, which would indicate perhaps that we have uh, black focus. <coughs> and up here, it's above the graph union, it was more speculative. And we were thinking, oh, okay, it looks like maybe we have a HESCA. And sure enough, that's what was going on in some of these vineyards. The vineyards that had these multiple infections were really hit hard, much harder than the ones where we were only finding one pathogen. So it's kind of, and especially if you're getting hit in the roots as well as uh, above the soil line, uh, it's hard for these vines to fight off a, a, something like that. Another example, there's a, there was a block of Chardonnay and Merlot, they're about five years old. And, and at five years, the Chardonnay, um, they're they're ready to be pulled out because they were in such rough shape. The, the Merlot was, was holding its own. There was a, a few vines that were struggling, but for the most part, it was looking quite healthy. Uh, the Chardonnay was cloned 76 on 3309, and the Merlot was cloned 81 on Riparia. So there is either a varietal difference, a clone difference, or uh, perhaps even root stock uh, but that's coming into play here when it comes to these diseases. Um, but the Chardonnay, as I can say, was, was completely obliterated. What we found in this was both uh, Blackfoot again down to the roots, so it was these black lesions and darkening of the vascular tissue. And above uh, in the trunk, we were finding cankers produced by uh, Botrysferia uh, species. And the species that caused the, the Botrysferia, Botrysferia parva, is uh, known to be one of the more aggressive species that causes this disease. So that, that wasn't helping matters at all uh, for those plants. We wanted to see if uh, nematodes played any, any role in this. Uh, and here we have a picture of the ring nematode with this little stylet that it goes around and, and punctures the roots as it grazes on, uh, on the grapevines. And in some vineyards, we, uh, we found uh, ring nematode populations in quite high numbers. And the numbers that we found them in were probably high enough to cause symptoms of uh, uh, delayed growth or stunted growth and uh, poor yield all by themselves. But you, you put that on, on with uh, getting hit by uh, cylinder car construction at the same time when these plants were hit doubly hard. But what happens is the, this, this nematode goes along, grazes, it wounds the plants, and it gives a, an entry, an easy entry point for cylinder carbon, the fungus, to enter and infect the vines, and that's how these guys work together. So, starting to wrap things up, this is more or less where we are to date with the, the disease survey of the Okanagan. Uh, we have Rosalaria root rots and, and other root rots that we've identified, bot canker, phalopsis, blackfoot disease, ESCA, uh, and you type up. If we go back a couple of years, what we knew about some of these diseases is this dieback caused by, was caused by you type up, you type a lava. Esca or young vine decline was caused by Phaemoniella chlamydospora or Phaeacrimonium aliophyllum. Uh, and Blackfoot was caused by Slytherin carbon destructins. If you go through the literature today, the dieback, including Botrysferia canker and the type of dieback is caused by over 40 different fungi worldwide. Uh, Esca is caused by 20 different fungi, and Blackfoot is associated with at least 10 different uh, fungi. And the reason this is important, and it's important to know what exact species we're dealing with, some of them, some of the pathogens are very aggressive, causing uh, uh, really aggressive uh, and severe disease symptoms, while other ones are quite quite a bit less aggressive, and so the disease symptoms will be much more mild. So it's, it is important to know what you're dealing with. And in order to pinpoint, uh, nail down what species we're dealing with, we've uh, relied on DNA sequencing using ribosomal ITS sequence, sequences, as well as beta tubulin and elongation factor genes. And what we do with this information is we blast, do a blast search of databases to uh, get an identity or a best match uh, of known species within the database to identify our, our isolates, or we do our own phylogenetic analysis with type cultures to find out what we have. 
And this is a tree that Jose, uh, the postdoc in our lab, has just put together for me just prior for, to me leaving. And what it indicates or shows here are all the different isolates or pathogens that have been uh, identified so far on our survey. Um, it's only the ITS gene that we sh we're showing here, and we're not showing any of the reference cultures uh, or sequences in this, just to keep it simple and, and readable. So what, uh, what we have, we have the bot canker species forming a clade or a group up here. We have Utaipa. Uh, where is it? Yeah. No? Yeah, I believe right, right in this clade or group. And uh, both ESCA splits into two groups. So we have one up here as well as one down here, I believe. Yes. So it's split into two different clades. The um, blackfoot we have in a clade right at the very bottom. One interesting thing, and I haven't talked about this group yet, and I didn't put it in my presentation, but it's it's a growing number of isolates that we're getting. So both Jose and Paula work who's working on this project are looking at this group of fungi quite uh, with quite a bit of interest because the number of uh, isolates that we are collecting are growing in number. And it would include uh, things like Phomopsis and Cytospora. So if we have a list of all the pathogens worldwide that are causing these fungi, we have about four of them uh, of the Utaipa dieback pathogens out of 21. Uh, out of the 19 uh, Esca young vine decline, Species. We have two in the Okanagan. Botrysferia canker uh, looks like we have at least six out of the 20 known species that cause this disease. Blackfoot, we have five out of the six blackfoot species uh, in the Okanagan, and a handful of other grapevine trunk diseases uh, such as uh, Phomopsis and Truncatella uh, and Cytospora also. Um, yeah. So where do we go from here? We're going to continue to expand our survey to, to take more samples, find out what we have to get a better picture of what we have in, in different parts of the valley as well as different aged vineyards and different varieties of, of vines. Um, we'll be doing more spore trap, uh, more spore trapping to get a better gain a better understanding of the biology of these pathogens in, in our northern climate. And uh, we're also going to uh, investigate additional um, control measures for these diseases. And the people that do all the work, both Paula Haig and Jose Urbez Torres, in the lab are both actively working on the grapevine trunk disease problem, as well as Julie Belay, another member of the team who works primarily on, on tree fruit. And funding came through the DIAC uh, program as well as the BC Wine Grape Council. And not to be too doom and gloom about all these disease problems, uh, I thought I'd put this one up and leave it to that Australians to turn a disease problem into a, an opportunity. Thanks very much. Dr. Goodler's lab and UC Davis has been working on these diseases for 
I don't know, 20 years maybe, maybe more, I don't know. Um, uh, Jose, who's up in our lab now, is a postdoc that uh, did his PhD in Doug Goober's lab and was down there for a number of years and comes with a, a great deal of experience. He's going to help us out a lot. Um, is, and that's about the extent of our, our collaboration now. Uh, I'm hoping to meet with a few people here while I'm out and, and see what's going on out in Ontario and the Niagara. Region. Uh, I don't know if it is a concern out here or not, but uh, I was hoping to have a chance to chat with some people over here. Yes? Do you uh, current nursery practices have any kind of control of needs a lot of these practices? Yeah, to, uh, the question was, do current nursery practices have any uh, impact on, on the diseases that we're seeing in the vineyards, more or less? Yeah, um, yeah some nurseries are definitely better than others uh, and do a better job at producing a clean, clean vine. Um, some of the diagnostics uh, that we're hoping to develop uh, could be utilized to, to test or, or, or certify nursery stock as before it comes in and gets planted. So it's one thing we'd like to look at. Uh, we haven't done any of that yet, but um, I think what I've heard is that some nurseries are definitely better at it than others. One uh, comment directed more for a jury and a follow-up question. I, I noticed that your uh, nitrogen levels for uh, free uh, soil applied dormant and the soil applied uh, raisin were quite low, which I was happy to see because we've been trying to get our growers to uh, apply nitrogen more in the uh, pre bloom period when there are actually some roots growing. Uh, are you starting to see your growers uh, apply nitrogen? when there are actually some root growth uh, taking place? Can you repeat the question and go to the microphone, please? Yeah, I, I'm not going to try and resume what all the growers are doing. I know it's quite a complicated story, but uh, um, one of the problems with uh, nitrogen is there's a lot of recycling of nitrogen within the plant. And we prune a lot of that stuff off in grapes. But uh, I think the trend in the last five years, 10 years, has been to early spring application at low rates. But the trouble is, there's a lot more yank problems now too. A lot of people are using diammonium, diammonium phosphate in the wine, which probably from a PR point of view, is not a good thing in the long run, I would suspect. But uh, I don't know uh, what the situation here in Ontario. Have you done much work on the timing of root growth? And we've, we've done uh, work on, uh, with, you know, with David Eisenstadt with the rhizotopes, mm -hmm. stuck them in the ground and so on, and, but not on grapes. We've done our, uh, on uh, tree fruits and was astonished to see that it really followed the irrigation pattern very much. There wasn't that much early growth before irrigation came on. Yeah, plus the soil's so cold that you're just not going to get that much biological activity. Yeah, yeah. You get into the domain of so it's Yeah, a lot, a lot of the early work on roots, I think, was done by Dave Well, but that would be small, I right? And the yeah. soil temperature regime here was quite different. So what we tended to, you know, we haven't investigated this with this N15, so we're going to get a better idea of what's going on there. but. Uh, what we've sort of done with fertigation, of course, you can change the application even within the season. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, I think the limitation there is we don't understand enough this uptake. Conrad is a guy taking up South Africa. Yeah, it's Conrad already done most of the really Yeah, ch yeah. chop the plants all apart and so on. And uh, so probably a pretty good thing, although their season, I'm sure, is a lot longer than ours. Mm -hmm. Probably longer than here, too. He uh, also shows a uh, a little surge of root growth at the end of the season yes. after harvest that yes. we don't get here, of course, or or any of the because the soils, uh, the soil temperature uh, goes down so much. Yeah, yeah, our, our temperature is actually, you know, being involved in this climate change is quite a revelation because you have all kinds of mythology about what your, what your climate really is, and when you start to measure things, you get shocked. But the thing about the Okanagan, everybody thinks hot, dry summers, and they are. July and August, but that curve is down very fast. 
yeah. we actually are still a cool climate but for that reason. And boy, they, those curves drop fast for soil temperature, for air temperature, for the whole thing. Yeah. And, uh, anyway, sorry. Uh, Jerry, question for you. With your later studies with the urea uh, foliar applications yes. uh, for nitrogen, and part of the reason for that is try to, trying to boost the, the yang value in, in yes, the juice. Yes. Is there any concern that that urea is staying in that form in, in the juice and not, yeah, right? Because yeah. urea during the fermentation can react with ethanol. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a good question. That's exactly the question I got when I was applying for the money from Hans Wuchler. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I'll give the same answer. Yeah, we're going to pay for that. <laughs> <laughs> We haven't done it, by the way, yet, but, uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah there, is, there are some co compounds and grapes that are not desirable, and uh, I think the link might not be there, but see, the, the trouble with the, the data I showed you is that you spray it on the, the, the plant, right? You spray it on everything, actually, because you can't distinguish. It'd be nice if you had a smart sprayer to yeah, pick it only the, the, the grapes, right? Or dump them in or something, but... Uh, so you're probably picking up some forms there, which you then measure. We don't really wash the things. We sort of reason, well, that's the way you're going to do it. And you're going to pull the stuff off and take it in and crush it. And, right. and so that's what we get kind of simulated that. But, but yeah, that's uh, why part of the reason why we do the N15 to see where it is. What is the form? Is it only your rea sitting on the outside? Or is it actually come in and then incorporated into the, you know, the composition of you know, amino acids? But uh, we, we, the guy, we have that, you're talking about associations, different people work with. We, we talk, we'd like to work with anybody that's interested. Uh, but we have traditions, we have a tradition working with the people of the mass specs in Scotland. We do a lot of stuff on 15 and over mobilization of other trees. And then they work with their group in Italy, which done a lot of other foods we don't do, but it's still on foods and so on. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, hopefully I'll be informed about what's actually really happening. Look forward to hearing the results. Yeah, we're going to see uh, trouble's not cheap, that's the problem. <laughs> Any other comment? Um, for Dan, um, some of the uh, remedial actions you suggested for Bob Kanger uh, included uh, lime salt. Mm -hmm. Would that be more spray after uh, leaf fall or just before buffers? Um, most that I've uh, I've seen is, is just before buffers. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure if it would. Yeah, it's something that could be looked at, but I, I haven't seen any any data that would suggest one would be better. Most of it is done just before buffers. Okay. And uh, the five percent boron acid. Yes. Is that something that's available commercially or something you have in Canada? The 5% boric acid uh, in latex paint, I don't think it's available in Canada. Uh, out of the Okanagan, people are mixing it up themselves. So, you know, if they're going to do it. A lot of people kind of, they don't like that, that route. They say it's just way too time consuming. Even if you're only, you know, painting the really large, large wounds, uh, they said, you know, it's just not feasible. Although, uh, if you had a small vineyard, perhaps you can go around and do that. The bigger guy said, mm, it's not going to happen. Um, but it does form a nice protective seal, and the boric acid is uh, uh, fungicidal or fungistatic, I think it is. Yeah. Trying to follow up on that question, is that done by hand application? You're talking about like small producers going around by hand and actually just dropping some of that boric acid in Boric acid, yeah. yes. So it, it is a hand ap application. Yeah. You have to do it painstakingly slow. One wound at a time. So. I think there are some wound paints for I think garden centers for yes. spraying in the aerosol. Yeah, I, I've seen some of those. And uh, what I've read is that any kind of protective layer may be better than none at all, even if it doesn't have the boric acid in it. But uh, if you form a, a layer, it may be beneficial. Um, I, I think a little bit more research is needed to, to see. Uh, at this time, it isn't ripped for bud burst. Like right now, sap's already flowing. So even if you've gone ahead and pruned and relieved, uh, we left a little uh, <coughs> wound essentially by the pruning, the sap's going to flow, and isn't it going to create itself its own little uh, healing mechanism to actually 
prevent any kind of uh, cankers developing or any kind of disease getting in there? Yeah, the question is, uh, at, at this time, if you're pruning late and the, the sap is already flowing, uh, would it protect, uh, would that develop it? So that's what someone has told me, so yeah. I'm not sure if that's... I've heard that too. Uh, one thing I've heard that it actually will wash off any spores that are potentially landing. Uh, the, I mean, the, the, uh, the wound itself will heal over time. Uh, I'm not sure, and depending on what temperatures you have, the warmer the temperatures, the faster I think the, the, the plant will heal the wound. Uh, but um, I'm not sure how long a period that is. Thank you.